The anomalous religions that the SCP Foundation has catalogued and studied over the years are many in number and bottomless in depth, with specialized paratheological researchers limiting themselves to just one or maybe two faiths, diving fully into a religion of their choice and mastering its forbidden knowledge. But the Foundation is careful to make sure that those researching these faiths don't succumb to their beliefs as many anomalous religions are dangerous to the organizations in practice, involving tasks such as making blood packs with ancient gods, or modifying one's body to better suit a divine purpose. There's some seriously nasty stuff involved in the immaterial world, almost to the point where it makes you wonder why anyone would be suckered into joining up with what appears to be, from the outside, just another cult of crazies. But let's not generalize. Religions, even those that are non-anomalous, are all strange from the outside, even if one may seem natural to you. But one anomalous religion stands out from all the rest as having more active followers, more history, and more documented culture than any other, and that is sarcasm. Hold on to your flesh, because today on SCP Explained, we're going to be answering the question, what is sarcasm? and hopefully don't get distracted and ritually sacrifice you, the viewer, in the name of the Grand Carcist Ion along the way. Let's get to it, meatbags. Before we begin, it's important to note that sarcasm is an incredibly dense and deep religion, and that covering every last detail of it in a short period of time would be a Herculean, nigh-impossible task for even the most well-read Sarkic lore masters. So where would you even start? What is sarcasm? To best understand that, we're going to bring you back all the way to the beginning of human history, to the ancient world of the Eurasian continent, where sprawling empires ruled and war between them was an all-too-common occurrence. In what is now central Siberia, the Davite Empire ruled with an iron fist. The Deva were a warrior culture, with militarism, conquest, gruesome human sacrifice, and thaumaturgic magic rituals being universally consistent in their culture according to the few historical accounts available that make mention of the Empire. The Davites practiced anomalous magic, arcane rituals, and sacrifices that bolstered their power, longevity, and standing within their society. The Empire was ruled by a theocratic aristocracy called the Deva, those who were especially attuned to the anomalous world, who practiced cannibalism and thaumaturgy, and whose bodies were so warped and modified by decades of magic alteration that Foundation historians would come to the conclusion that the Deva were so divergent from modern humans that they could be considered a separate species altogether. But how the Deva relate to sarcasm remains the question, and the answer is found in the Empire's slave-owning culture. The Davites owned many, many slaves, people they had brought or taken from their lands as a sign of pure Davite power in the form of ownership over another human being. Davite city-states had massive, sprawling slave populations, and among those was a young boy by the name of Ion. Ion's appearance would be depicted over the years by Sarkic art and culture as inconclusive and varied, whether it was their gender or even the question of whether or not Ion resembled a human. The cult of personality that would crop up around Ion would be a testament to Sarkicism's eventual widespread culture. But it was here in ancient western Siberia where those seeds of sarcasm originated. According to the most prominent Sarkic texts, Ion was a slave, like many others in the Davite Empire. Born into slavery by a Davite mother and a concubine father, the circumstances of Ion's birth indicate that he was destined to be a slave from the onset. But there was something remarkable about them. Ion, in the eyes of his masters, was different from other slaves. He was intelligent, and so much so that the decision was made for Ion to serve under a Davite priestess, where he could hone his skills to serve the Empire in ways unlike the other slaves, who toiled away constructing massive public works or died in foreign lands on the field of battle. Ion did not understand what differentiated him from others and why he deserved such special treatment, but it was the realization that the only thing separating him from his masters was the possession of power that would serve as the basis for Sarkicism's founding doctrines. Ion watched in horror as those they knew succumbed to the backbreaking work that the Empire forced upon its slaves, and how prevalent death and destruction were among its people. Inside, Ion grew a great rage for the Davites, who flaunted their power over others in the form of slavery. He wished to transcend the physical limitations that kept him and his fellow slaves in bondage and service to the Davites. 
Ion knew that their masters practiced thaumaturgy, a form of magic that granted great power to its users. And in a brutal world where power is what defines who is master and who is slave, the prospects of achieving it became more important to Ion than anything else. If he could harness such power for himself, Ion could break free from the chains of slavery that kept him subservient to those Davite masters. He would achieve apotheosis, the belief that an individual could ascend to godhood through raw power and unbridled will. Over time, Ion's hatred of the so-called living gods of the Deva grew so strong that he actively began plotting their downfall. Around 1800 BCE, Ion's influence among the lowest ranks of the empire was inescapable. He was charismatic, he was a slave, he was powerful, and he spoke of violence, of seizing Davite magic for himself and using it to elevate himself into power. Ion's tenets and beliefs appealed to the slave population, who also grew hungry for freedom. Ion's creed spread like wildfire and would form the basis for all Sarkic belief in the centuries that came. First, there was apotheosis, which Ion was striving to achieve, and the path to doing so was the will to power. The next belief covered that concept in depth. Ion believed that the will to power was the primary driving force of man. As an individual seeks to master all things within its domain, they exert that power onto others, and others have the ability to exert it back in opposition. Desire is the measure of power, and those with a stronger will always triumph over the weak. The next belief was the act of theophagy, a hypothetical tenant that Ion was toying with after observing the Davite religion for years. Theophagy referred to the act of sacrificial consumption of a god, and upon eating them, achieving thaumaturgical, reality-bending, and all-powerful abilities. There were many gods in the universe, and this Ion knew, but none of them were fit for him to worship. Instead, he would crave their power. As a metaphorical example of Theophagy, Ion wanted nothing more than to consume the Davite Empire whole, taking its power for his own. Next, there was the idea of sacrifice. Whether it was for the sacrifice of the self for the benefit of many, or the sacrifice of many for the benefit of the individual, Ion believed, much like his masters, that ritual sacrifice was a powerful tool that could be used as a means to achieve an end. Those who commanded the sacrifice were showing their power, bringing them that much closer to apotheosis. Those who were sacrificed were experiencing strife, which would only make them stronger than before. Muscles suffer damage, but eventually heal. The mind develops toleration against hardship, such as slavery. This cycle of destruction and regeneration in strife was, according to Ion, one of the greatest tutors in the natural world. Ion's final core belief would be the most prominent outward-facing indicator of sarcasm, and that was the idea of shepherding the flesh. Ion believed that all living things descended from a single progenitor, an all-powerful god known as Yaldabaoth who the Sarkists would later regard as the principal power in the universe. Yaldabaoth's relationship with Sarkicism is tenuous at best, with modern Sarkic cults either admiring or fearing the enemy. One thing is certain though, Yaldabaoth remains present in all Sarkic culture, even if the religion doesn't exactly worship the god itself. Yaldabaoth was a destroyer who fed upon gods, worlds, and stars, who incidentally created the entire universe and life itself as a result of its power-hungry actions. The creation stories talk of Yaldabaoth as a blind entity, driven solely by instinct, fueled by the forces of primordial chaos. As life was created as a result of Yaldabaoth's existence, it was ultimately unguided by intelligence, and its spread throughout the universe was similar to that of a germ than anything grand or divine. Ion, upon learning of these myths, came to the conclusion that the multiverse itself was only an altar that held life's existence, which was brought into reality for the ultimate sacrifice at the hands of Yadaba. The entity would one day reclaim all of existence for itself, harvesting what it created and consuming it whole, as this was Yadaba's nature and purpose as the ultimate being of the cosmos. Ion saw this shared ancestry among life as the key to genetic modification. As all life was derived from Yadavath, it held a similar genetic code, and it would become the Sarkic right to guide and cultivate organic matter, stealing the genes of other life forms or creating entirely new ones. Through this perversion of life, Ion felt he could ascend from something ordinary 
to a living God, fueled by the unending cycle of sacrifice and creation. With his radical power-hungry beliefs rapidly spreading throughout the Davite Empire, mostly among its slaves, the leading Deva became fearful of Ion. Attempts to assassinate him or usurp Ion's influence were met with failure and only fueled the mission of his followers, furthering the belief that if they were to achieve godhood, they had to overthrow the Davites, who were the most present, all-powerful beings in their lives. This all came to a head when Ion launched his final act against the Davite Empire. After years of sowing the seeds of disharmony and hate among the slave population, Ion rallied his followers and swept them up into a full-scale rebellion. In a short time, Ion overthrew the province he grew up in, fueled by the rage of his followers, who mercilessly raised the city and slaughtered the Davites like animals. Those who were present could see the inscription Ion brought to his followers, how he commanded them as if he were a living god, how he used the reality-bending magic of the Deva and turned it against them with his followers utilizing anomalous warfare in a horrific, gruesome way. Flesh was turned into a weapon. Living beings were contorted and transformed into monstrosities and abominations that fueled the Sarkic war machine. Deva Thaumaturgy simply could not compete against the permeating, powerful, and unrestricted abilities of Ion's followers. Before long, the city fell before the being who had, in that moment of bloodlust and fury, achieved apotheosis. The being who is now known as the Grand Karsist Ion. The Grand Karsist and his followers rampaged through the ancient world, felling cities and entire empires to serve as stepping stones in their path to godhood. Their weapons and armor were unlike anything else at the time, and their utilization of powerful flesh-bending magic made them unstoppable on the field of battle. The city of Aditium was established as the Sarkic Holy City, where Ion ruled as the Sorcerer King and as a living deity. Texts from this period suggest that Ion had somehow usurped control of Yadaboth, the Devourer itself, wearing the flesh of the Old God as a sort of armor and crafting a kingdom from its body. While the depiction is most likely only a metaphor for how much Ion resembled Yadaboth in philosophy and pure power, the image of a living god devouring and succeeding the Old One is a striking visual that surely empowered many Sarkists at the time. Another story from Sarkic mythology during this period is the Six Ordeals of Ion, a parable that told of six challenges that were issued to Ion by the Archons, the servants of Yadaboth, who challenged the newly crowned king of Editum. By enduring their trials, Ion mastered the rituals, practices, and beliefs ubiquitous to Sarkicism and broke free from the bondage of mortal limitations. But the authenticity of this myth is debated, and the nature of the ordeals and Ion's further relationship with Yaldabaoth remains unknown. But why did the Grand Karsist Ion, with his flowing red robes and wielding his all-powerful staff, who twisted flesh and drew blood when he so much as drew breath, fall into such obscurity that his religion remains a mysterious and obscure footnote in the Foundation's archives? If the Sarkists were as powerful as these early texts state, where are they today? Why did the horrific city of Aditum, built of living organic material that stood monument to Ion's indomitable will, fall? In Sarkicism's Golden Age, from 1600 and 1200 BCE, the religion's permeation was inescapable. Like the diseases they wielded in their wars, Sarkicism spread like a contagion around the world. Everywhere they went, they assimilated tribes and villages into their ranks, fighting under the banner of Aditum and the Sarkic faith. This expanded empire would be referred to as Kalmaktama, or the Deathless. Many tried to defeat these brutal invaders, including the king of the Hittite Empire himself, but all fell before them. As the Kalmaktama Empire attempted to establish a foothold in the Mediterranean, invading and colonizing the islands of Cyprus, Crete, and Giros, for the first time in Sarkic history, the tides of war began to turn against the religion. A coalition of kingdoms were formed in response to the Sarkic threat, created by the Egyptians, Greeks, Minoans, Canites, Assyrians, and most importantly, the Mechanites, who were the followers of the Church of the Broken God. The cult of Mechane, the Broken God, had urged these kingdoms to unite against the Sarkic threat, and now united, outfitted their allies with superior Mechanite technology that anomalously enhanced the Empire's war capabilities, putting them on par with the Sarkic Death Sorcerers. And so, a great war was waged between the Kalmaktama Empire and the Coalition of Kingdoms. The details of such are largely lost to time, 
but the war itself was fought with the full power of the Sarkists and the Mechanites clashing with one another, and its consequences left an imprint on the Earth itself. A death toll that estimates place at 20 to 30 million, mass graves, anomalous weapons, and even the deployment of giant mechanical beings created by the Mechanites known as Colossi that rampaged through Sarkic settlements and cities. Though the battle was costly on both sides, the Kalmaktama Empire fell to the coalition, and the once impenetrable city of Editum was destroyed forever. Sarkicism would fall into obscurity, and the empire would be forgotten, possibly because it was much easier than remembering the horrors Ion subjected the world to. The Grand Karsist himself disappeared, his whereabouts unknown shortly after the fall of Editum. Some said he had ascended into godhood, leaving the world behind. Others said he was slain in battle, nothing more than a man who believed he would never die. The Sarkic religion was effectively extinguished from the world, never to be seen again. Or so, that's what the coalition was led to believe. Though the Empire and Aditum fell, and Ion disappeared, an idea as tantalizing and powerful as Sarkicism is difficult to snuff out entirely. In reality, Sarkicism would continue in secret in both its homeland in the Urals and among the offshoot tribes that had fought under Aditum's banner. These sects of Sarkicism would practice their beliefs in their war-ravaged homeland, which suffered a great collapse, resulting in the fall of kingdoms, a crisis of refugees, and a decline of art, literature, science, and technology. Lingering disease and famine from Sarkic biological weapons spread even to the kingdoms of the coalition resulting in an event historians refer to as the Late Bronze Age Collapse. The empire that was once deathless had now fallen, but its followers remained, practicing their power-craving rituals in secret and without centralization. This led to a Sarkic Dispora, where various sects and Sarkic cults, each with culturally distinct beliefs, would crop up throughout the Eurasian continent. While the Foundation is unsure of the specifics of these cults' activities and beliefs, Elements of Sarkicism would soon begin to permeate the upper echelon of society, infiltrating Carpathian cults or sought out by nobles themselves who ignored the rumors of devil worship and witchcraft to seek out Sarkic power for their courts. The tempting power that Sarkicism granted made it a popular choice to be practiced in secret by upper-ranking royals and even entire noble families. From their position of power, where they had access to knowledge, influence, and a fresh supply of sacrifices, Sarkicism endured. Over time, this would result in the formation of Sarkic Great Houses, where families practiced their own interpretation of Sarkicism, the religion that was now mutated into hundreds upon hundreds of variations and subcultures. These Great Houses would focus on individualism, and applying their powers to fulfill their self-serving needs. Sarkicism, now decentralized completely, would spread throughout Europe via marriage as a high society of cults and magicians whose true motives for ruling their kingdoms and provinces were kept hidden behind their meaty flesh curtain of absolute secrecy. Today, the Sarkic cults persist, and their anomalies are frequently uncovered by the Foundation. Understanding them and their religion, however, is another ordeal entirely, and the majority of Sarkic history, culture, and practices are unknown to the organization, but they're still out there, in the highest ranks of urban society, in the most remote villages of the world. There will always be those who crave to wield flesh, the followers of Ion who hope to achieve apotheosis, however they may believe they can do so. Though the details remain unclear, there is one thing the Foundation has realized over its years of studying the religion. Sarkicism has, and always will, remain. Now go check out SCP-3989 The Bone Orchard and SCP-610 The Flesh That Hates for more of those squishy Sarkicists.